In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. I am talking with Tom Woodroof of Mutual Credit Services, who made the shift from the world of nuclear physics to the world of mutual credit. Hello, Tom. Hi, Dave. So at Low Impact, we believe that the mutual credit family of ideas will form the basis of the emerging commons economy. So we're very interested in why you made that huge move and what you're up to now. Um, I know that you're, you're working with Dill Green and others at Mutual Credit Services. Mm -hmm. uh, you're part of the Credit Commons Society team, yep. and you've joined Low Impact too. And in fact, you're going to be on the other side of these interviews soon, doing, mm -hmm. doing the interviewing. <laughs> um, but first, tell us about the nuclear physics world. How did you get into it, and, and what were you doing? Well, I did my undergrad degree in physics at the University of Manchester, um, and I found that nuclear physics was actually one of the only bits of the course I found really, really interesting. I've kind of since realized a lot of the stuff I was taught in modules on like thermodynamics, for example, could potentially have been really interesting. Um, but either I wasn't paying enough attention or just the way they were presented meant that although, you know, you can you can try and understand life through the lens of thermodynamics and certainly the economy, in theory, they could have been, you know, fascinating and useful. But as I say, maybe I wasn't paying enough attention or maybe the way it was presented wasn't particularly compelling. But I found actually most of the physics curriculum I wasn't really that interested in. But nuclear physics was one of the exceptions. Um, I got really, really, and I'm not quite sure why, but I got really fascinated by, um, I guess, the range of things, the, the, ra the, the range of things which an atomic nucleus can look like. Um, there's all sorts of very interesting effects going on there. Um, it's kind of on, on the boundary, in terms of scale, it's on the boundary between quantum physics and classical physics. And what that means is that um, you can actually understand quite a lot about the, the structure of the atomic nucleus um, using kind of classical physics concepts, which are relatively common sense, but also you get quantum effects, which means you have all sorts of really, really interesting phenomena going on. And for some reason, I'm not quite sure why I found that fascinating. Um, and so by the time I finished my degree, um, I got really, really into um, nuclear structure physics. Um, and then uh, a while after I'd graduated, I was looking into doing a PhD. Um, and actually, my girlfriend at the time found one which was um, in much more applied. It wasn't just pure nuclear structure physics. It was working with gamma radiation detectors to try and understand the dynamics of radioactive fallout in the environment, for example, around uh, Fukushima or Chernobyl. Right. And I kind of looked at that and thought, this looks, first of all, it's applied. And I've always very much liked um, applied work, kind of lab-based work. Um, and it combined my interests in nuclear physics and environmental science. And I thought this actually looks really, really fascinating. So I went for it and did that for four years. Right, four years. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so talk talk us through the process. Why and how did you make the change to mutual credit? <laughs> so I was, I came across, well, because of yours and Dill's writing is the kind of, I guess, the, the immediate cause. I, I came across low impact, I think in 2017. So probably when I was about halfway through my PhD. So it's my fault. Um, it's your fault. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Entirely your fault. <laughs> Um, so I, I, came, I can't remember exactly how I came across low impact and non-corporate. I think they must have been linked to from some other, you know, sustainability site. You know, I've been pretty much my entire adult, adult life, you know, trying to work out, you know, how does the world actually work? You know, what's actually going on? You know, what is this civilization we've built? Um, and is it just a massive bubble? Um, and trying to work out if that's the case, which, you know, as I started paying attention to what was going on in the world um increase, increasingly came to the conclusion that it was and if so you know why is nobody talking about it why isn't everyone kind of running around panicking and trying to kind of reconcile that in my head um so anyway came across low impact i think in about 2017 and i hadn't heard of mutual credit before i'd kind of heard of community currencies i'd heard of the bristol pound 
um, and thought, oh, you know, that sounds very interesting. Um, I'm sure the economy and money clearly has something to do with the predicament we're in, probably at a fairly fundamental level, but it wasn't anything more than a vague awareness. And so I started reading your articles about mutual credit, um, and I'd never come across anything like it before. And it was, you know, drawing connections between the monetary system, the economy, and, you know, society and uh, the biosphere in ways which I wasn't seeing anyone else talking about. But of course, I was, I had my PhD on at the time, so I couldn't really, I kind of mentally filed it away as, you know, another possible rabbit hole to dive into in the future. Um, I finished up my PhD towards the end of 2019. I then did a really, really brief stint at the Institute of Cancer Research at the start of 2020, but then found out very quickly that wasn't for me. Um, and so quit that just before the first lockdowns happened. Um, and by that point, in fact, I'd actually become quite heavily involved in Extinction Rebellion. Um, and so having quit my job and also being um, very aware that there was not a whole lot of point in applying for other ones given lockdown had just started, um, I ended up putting myself even more into that and was doing that full time for a few months um, before eventually becoming somewhat disillusioned with, with that. And then I kind of remembered, in fact, because I was still reading, I was still following Low Impact. And I think you posted an article or something about the Open Credit Network. I then followed that through to the OCM website and saw you were advertising for, I think it was even onboarding businesses. And I kind of thought, well, you know, sure, I'm sure I could get good at that pretty quickly. So I shot you and I think Dill an email at the OCN and basically said, oh, yeah, I saw you're looking for volunteers and I don't really have any kind of background in finance or economics, but it's a lifelong interest. Um, and, you know, I hope I can find a way to make myself useful. And so we had a couple of calls. I think that would have been June 2020. It was summer 2020 anyway. And then you were kind enough to invite me along to what was then the early mutual credit services collaboration. Um, what kind of was it about what was it about <clears throat> mutual credit that grabbed your attention? I think I guess it didn't it wasn't just taking money for granted. You know, people a lot of people talk about, you know, how the financial system and how money causes all sorts of problems but I wasn't seeing and lots of very interesting analysis around that but reading about mutual credit was the first time I'd seen anyone say something both sensible and accessible about what money actually was and the idea that you could design it differently I guess I was conscious on some level like most people that money has evolved you know digital money hasn't been around for that long um and you know obviously coins appeared at some points and before that there were Know, just accounting records on clay tablets so i had a vague sense of kind of history that of course money must have evolved and taken on different forms i guess the idea that you could consciously analyze and design different forms of money with the hope of achieving different outcomes at the kind of systemic level i hadn't really seen that comprehensively explored anywhere else um, and the way it was presented on low impact which made those connections and pointed towards the kind of a world which could plausibly emerge if exchange and investment were underpinned by different forms of money that to me was completely new um and kind of felt like right this is a whole new angle on you know things which i've spent much of my adult life getting increasingly worried and frightened about <clears throat> do, you, do you see mutual credit as a form of money because I, whenever I mention mutual credit, I always use the, the term moneyless. It's moneyless mm -hmm. trading. So is it, is it moneyless or is it a, just a different kind of money? Um, I don't really have particularly strong views on that. I wouldn't describe it. It's certainly not money as we know it. I don't know. I think you can draw a useful distinction between money and credit. Um, and I think it's most useful, I guess, because money has so many, can, is understood in so many different ways, whereas credit is a much clearer term. And of course, you can have different forms of credit and different credit relationships. But I, I don't really talk about mutual credit as being a moneyless exchange system because that just kind of, it tends to freak people out a bit if you say moneyless exchange. They, they assume you're talking about barter, for example, and then you've got to explain how, in yeah. a sense, yes, it is a form of barter, but it's multilateral barter. Yeah. And then you're kind of lost in the weeds and you've, and you've lost the interesting bit, which really gets people engaged, yeah. um, which is what becomes possible on the basis of these systems. So I don't really... Talking about it as moneyless is probably true in some sense um, and probably could be useful in the right context, but it's not really where I'd start. I think just talking about it as, as, a, as a form of credit-based system is accurate and um, 
you know, I guess you, you, could, you could have an endless conversation about the difference between money and credit, depending on what definitions you yeah, prefer. But so it's, 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 it's a bog. Yeah, <clears throat> if, if mutual credit is a, is a form of money, it's not the form of money that you can put in a bag with swag written across it. Right, it's, right, it's, right. It's not that kind of money. Oh, the it's thing is, you, you can get a system, isn't it? Yeah, it, exactly. It's accounting for exchange. And I think you've, you know, one of the things me and Dill have, we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about is how you communicate the stuff to different audiences in yeah. order to, to to give yourself the best possible chance of having a constructive conversation. And that turns out to be quite an art. You know, you've got to judge the audience and judge where they're, they're, they're at. You know, we're willing to go as deep as people want to. You know, if you really kind of, you know, you know about Brett Scott, you know, he writes incredibly well about this. I think the most useful distinction to draw is between, as you say, money is this kind of thing you can put in a, in a bag labeled swag and you think of it as as a thing, as a commodity versus, you know, a form of credit um, and drawing that distinction as Brett does extremely well between the commodity and credit orientations to money to the right audience is a really useful place to start. Yeah. Um, but it's far too abstract and far too removed from everyday experience to be the basis for a useful conversation with most people. Yeah, I mean, I've found different, thing, different things with different people. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Calling it a moneyless trading system, it can confuse people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But for people who haven't got much money or no money mm. at all, the, the word moneyless suddenly makes them sit up and take notice. It's like, hang on, I can do things without money. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that is true. And actually, to be fair, the most effective, you know, we, we try and avoid elevator pitches. But, you know, if you're trying, if you're in the startup world and if you're at networking events, sometimes you're forced to. The best kind of 30 second elevator pitch we've been able to come up with is adapting tools used by the banks and the financial sector for moneyless exchange, adapting those and making them available for the real economy of business networks and communities. And of course, that uses the word moneyless. Um, but there's something interesting going on there because people associate, you know, banks in the financial sector with just with money, rightly so. But actually, it turns out, you know, there's this incredibly long history going back hundreds of years of banks and financial um, firms trying to avoid the use of money um, because even for them it's expensive, right? You know, if they're if they if they've got cash, that's money they're not investing and earning a return on. So they've come up with all of these all of these mechanisms for trade effectively trading without money, which in the jargon alone known as liquidity saving mechanisms. Um, and the interesting message there is that actually, you know, these things are completely normal within the financial sector, but they're just not made available to the real economy. Right, and that's so the that, message which seems to resonate. And that, as I say, is talking about moneyless exchange. Yeah. Um, so this, you know, it's it's, it's not it's not a term I always avoid, uh, but you have to do quite a lot of work to explain it and put it in a context where it doesn't immediately terrify people. Yeah. And you can do that by explaining that actually this stuff is completely part of the course in the financialized, in, in, the, in the financial sector. Yeah, I guess if the banks do it, um, it's not uh, it's not so wacky and sort of radical and uh, um, it's some and some like, and so, also yeah. I guess it, it might make people think well hang on a bit if the banks do it this this might be beneficial to me you know it's it's um, they don't seem right. to have done too badly exactly exactly that you know they're doing it for a reason which is obviously not to say that everything the banks do makes sense because we've seen post two thousand eight that's clearly not true but on the other hand you know as you say they they seem to be doing all right for themselves. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's sort of, um, yeah, makes it a bit more of an establishment thing rather than a wacky way out there thing. Exactly. And that, that's that's really, you know, we, we kind of realised that really about a year after MCS got started when we came across Tomasz Fleischmann's work where he's been, or he has been involved in running one of these liquidity saving mechanisms in the real economy at the national scale in Slovenia for decades. And that was kind of when we realised actually, you know, not only is it counterproductive to communicate what we're doing in terms of, you know, we're the radicals, we're edgy, you know, we're going to, you know, kind of turn, turn, turn things upside down. Not only does that kind of switch off most people, it's also simply not true. You know, if, if you look at the history um, of, of these liquidity saving mechanisms, you know, they've been invented and implemented in some cases for hundreds of years. Um, and all we're really doing is adapting them for uh, the real economy and making them available to everybody else. Yeah, yeah. You're, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're throwing a few names around. <laughs> mm. um, I'll, I'll put links to those people in the in the blog article. Yeah. 
yeah, and we're work, we're actually working very closely with Tomash uh, on the local loop project in Lancaster, which is exactly exactly that. We're we're bringing one of these liquidity saving mechanisms to Lancaster, um, but at a community scale as opposed to the national scale, like they've been doing in Slovenia. Okay, so I'll come to that. So um, yeah, I, I, I'd like you to explain a few of these things that you're doing. Um, yeah, um, yeah, in terms that mere mortals might understand. So yeah, let's let's talk about your work at Mutual Credit Services. Um, what's the what's the problem you're trying to solve? I mean, we so what what got me really interested? You know, I was drawn into this by the stuff you write about low impact. You know, sustainability, um, inequality. Um, you know, basically preparing for the crash and trying to build adaptive capacity um, for when the bubble inevitably bursts. Um, you know, that's why I'm doing this work ultimately. Um, but that's kind of very, it's not, that's not as, as I guess still likes to put it, that's not something resilience and adaptation and healthier emergent outcomes are not things you can build. You know, you've, you've got to build concrete infrastructure, which makes those outcomes, which makes it possible for those outcomes to emerge. So at the kind of very high, abstract conceptual level those are the problems where i think you know trying to solve is probably too strong but at least trying to address um or yeah speak to um but in more concrete practical terms from day to day the problems we're trying to solve look much more like building our own deep understanding of for example these liquidity saving mechanisms and these these various techniques for money just exchange of which mutual credit is just one and trying to find ways to, to use those tools to build platforms which ordinary people can engage with um, and which they can look at. And there's an obvious, immediate, clear benefit for them in doing so in hard economic terms um, yeah. and communicate it in such a way that doesn't scare people off. So would it be fair to say that you see mutual credit and, and the sort of mutual credit-like ideas as a kind of lifeboat to help people get what they need um, even if there's a, an economic collapse? I mean, by themselves, you know, the tools don't really do anything. You know, you've, you've got to build a platform which people can actually, can actually engage with and, and, you know, becomes a part of their life. That then, and, and, and yes, you know, past a certain level of adoption, if there was a community which had, you know, a, a functioning mutual credit system, it really would provide them with a good degree of insulation from wider financial crises. Um, and this has been demonstrated in peer-reviewed literature by um, Jim Stodder, for example, who studied Veer Bank in Switzerland, which has been running since 1934. And he's shown quite clearly that even though it accounts for, I think, maybe one or two percent of the Swiss economy, it does have a macro stabilizing effect um, when there are wider economic downturns. So absolutely, yes, you know, these tools really can insulate communities from economic crises. Um, yeah, so that, that that's one way of looking at it is that it 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 provides a significant measure of resilience and yeah, I suppose a lifeboat is is not a bad way of looking at it. I think well, where it gets really interesting as well is the um, effects it could possibly have on relocalizing the economy, driving mm -hmm. import substitution, mm -hmm. and supporting local trade, um, which is clearly going to be necessary, and and also strongly decentralizing the economy so that it can so that we can adapt to you know climate change mass extinction breakdown of food supply chains all of these things which are coming our way um i i, I see that mutual credit and related ideas the outcomes they drive and the the kind of forces the the, the incentives they provide um will over time lead to significant um a significant increased ability to adapt <clears throat> So yeah, so I, uh, so you got you, there are a range of tools that you're using, but you, you're saying that community community building is the most important thing, right? Yeah, or, or yeah you won't have yeah. anywhere to use those tools. Well, well exactly, and, and people aren't going to pe people aren't going to engage with something if they. I mean, so we've we've kind of gone gone a bit back and forth on this. So initially, Dylan myself reacted very strongly against a tendency in, I guess, alternative economic. Um, projects which emphasize completely the community benefits they say basically if everyone did this you know the world would be a much better place 
And that might be true, but if you don't think carefully about at the individual level why people would bother to participate, then not surprisingly, once the kind of goodwill and the sense of novelty and the initial momentum runs out, you know, these projects always basically fail. Um, and so initially we were really clear that everything we design, it has to be really, really obvious why from an individual point of view, you would want to participate in this, you know, the what's in it for me question. So of yeah. course, we always pay attention to that, but what we've learned um, in Lancaster in particular, as we've started talking to people like the city council, the chamber of commerce, they at least are very, very interested in more systemic local economic conditions. You can talk to them about community wealth building. You can talk to them about the circular economy um, and about you know these these resilience measures, and they really really like it. And so actually, we've kind of learned that in terms of a marketing strategy, we can kind of hit both. Um, we need to be able to speak to the what's in it for me, but we shouldn't be afraid of saying actually at the community level, you know these 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 tools really can um, can help. But again, it just comes back to who you're talking to. Yeah, I mean, I've 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 talked to lots of people involved with lots of projects. Uh, a lot of the projects sort of rely entirely on altruism. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I just yeah. it makes me think. Hmm. Mm. What, what percentage of what percentage of the world are are driven by altruism? And I don't think it's that many, really. I think I, th I think I, I think what's needed is is um, benefits need to be brought immediately to ordinary yes. people in working class communities. Right. I, I, I think a lot more people would be driven by altruism if they had the chance. But, you know, economic conditions are such that fewer and fr fewer and fewer of us, you know, could really afford that, frankly. And if yeah. you can't, if, if, if you're offering something which people sense is actually going to make their lives economically harder, then, you know, with the best will in the world, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, yeah. So, yeah, by all means, don't be, you know, it's great to be able to appeal to altruism. And ultimately, you know, people aren't, I don't, I don't want to kind of take that cynical you know, mainstream economics attitude that people are, you know, only respond to economic incentives and don't, you know, care for each other. That's kind of depressing and self-defeating. But at the same time, you know, you really, you know, as 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 as, as things escalate, um, you know, offering things which don't have clear, immediate, obvious benefits is just not going to fly, basically.